What's up YouTube, my name is Dallas from Nog TV, and I'm so excited to get into this video because it's the first one in a new series I'm trying out. Now look, there's no doubt that The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time is a classic masterpiece and a classic franchise. And given that it's my personal favorite game of all time, no pun intended, I wanted to try my hand at breaking it down dungeon by dungeon, starting with of course the first dungeon that you come across not even very long into the game, the Great Deku Tree. So, without further ado, let's hop into some tree's mouths, shall we? Alright, don't mind me, just gonna walk into this tree's mouth. Gobble me up, yes. So before we get really far into it, I want to kind of talk about the five categories that I decided to use when breaking them down. And I'm going to talk about them probably in an order of shortest to most complicated, if that makes sense. The first one being the music, the audio, the soundtrack. For the great Deku Tree, you can probably agree with me that the soundtrack there does its job. I mean, it serves its purpose as a mysterious ambiance, sort of, but it's not really memorable. Uh, I do wish it were slightly better, considering that it is the first dungeon in the game. I just, it's not something that you're going to put on in the car and jam to, or listen to when you're doing some homework to pump you up. It's not really epic, it's not mysterious enough in the sense of the forest temple. It's not at least as weird as the original music they had in the fire temple. So in that area of field, I give the Great Deku Tree a notch just below mid. <laughs> The next one would be the visuals, you know, kind of like how it feels when you look around, like the vibes you get. And obviously with it being inside of a tree, it looks like you're inside of a tree. So I guess, I mean, I don't really know. None of us have really ever been in a tree that I know of. If you have, leave in the comments because that's kind of interesting. I mean, with the spider web enemies and all and Goma being a spider, it makes sense to have all the spider webs around, make it kind of old and dusty and spooky. And the Great Deku Tree does say he's been poisoned or he's he's a little sick, so it makes sense that you have different spider webs and kind of things to make it look like it's it's abnormal. Things are not as usual. But then it makes you wonder what does the inside of the Great Deku Tree look like before all of this took place and before all of the enemies came in and made him their home. I don't know. Maybe that's too much to get into. But yeah, it's kind of drab, doesn't have a lot of color, but it's to be expected. So similar to the last category, it kind of does its purpose and fulfills its job, but nothing more than expected, nothing more, nothing less. Maybe a little bit better because it's not as disappointing. So for these next three categories, it might be a little more of a discussion here, with the third category being the dungeon weapon. And with the slingshot, it is basic, but it makes sense given that you need a long range weapon early on, and the game basically pioneered the Z targeting. So long range Z targeting and shooting was basically a no brainer early on and it works because given the time that was a new thing so I'm sure it probably wowed a lot of people at the time. Just like some other dungeon weapons it makes you use it almost immediately to get the ladder down to cross the room. It makes killing the small sculptures doable so I mean you can technically get past them without killing them it's just a little more of a headache. Alright we're just gonna oh okay that did not last long I was trying to just prove that you can climb up there and still make it up there but it's probably easier it's probably easier when you have the slingshot it also allows you to shoot down goma larva before ever hatching which by the way shout out to my friend Bates who told me they were named goma larva I was gonna call them goma babies apparently that's not the name Bruh. it's obviously necessary to use the slingshot to kill goma by stunning her in the eye and you can shoot her down from the ceiling to avoid her having more babies or goma larva hatching it's a neat weapon early on, but it gets replaced once you're an adult with the much more useful bow. So while I understand it's training you to use the better version of the weapon later on when you're an adult, the fact that you just don't need it for half the game is a little disappointing, so it's not even like you're taking it with you for the rest of the time being. And for the next or last category, this one was a little hard to put a title on. I just kind of label it as dungeon design slash puzzles. I mean, maybe you guys can kind of get the idea. It's really just a dungeon that's kind of built vertically, designed to be climbed up first, and then dove, dive, d dove down secondly into the spider web and underground. It's not very wide, so you're pretty much just going up and then down. It's not hard to traverse unless you wanted to climb up the big hole for the sculpture down below, which you actually can't get on your first visit. You got to come back with bombs and the boomerang. But an easy trick there is to use Furore's Wind later on and just warp back to the entrance. 
Now obviously as soon as you walk into the dungeon you see the big web on the floor that you're going to have to climb all the way up and jump down and break. So if you want to consider that a puzzle, that's obviously a big part of the dungeon. There's also several puzzles involving learning how to light sticks, use them for torches or burning webs, which makes sense given the enemies in the dungeon. There is a puzzle where it requires you to swim underwater to hit the switch, I believe in the basement, to lower the water to cross the room. And it was different, but still kind of meh. I personally like the Master Quest version more, but I'm not going to get into the Master Quest dungeons right now. The last puzzle in the dungeon requires you to hit the Deku Scrubs in a certain order, which is 23 is number one. Well, I always remember it as a Michael Jordan is the best basketball player. Michael Jordan is number one. Even though these days kids will say LeBron or whatever. And for the last category, I kind of just lumped in the enemies with the overall difficulty of the dungeon from what I felt like. Now obviously this is going to differ a little bit from if this is your first time playing the dungeon, if this is your first time playing a Zelda game at all, or if you're a Zelda veteran and you've played it multiple times. Now I don't know about you, but to me as a kid when I played this game, Sculptulous were pretty scary. But now they're just roadblocks, basically used to teach Z-targeting for slingshotting. The Deku Scrubs were lame enemies, also meant for teaching shielding and deflecting. The Deku Baba served no purpose other than to provide nuts and sticks, which, okay, I get it, you need an unlimited source of ammunition. The Goma Larva are kind of a cool little foreshadow enemy to the boss, which is Goma, but there are only three in the whole dungeon if you're not considering the boss fight. It's in one room, and you can actually kill them before they hatch by just using the slingshot to hit them from the roof. As far as Legend of Zelda bosses go, it's pretty hard to argue against Goma being one of, if not the most iconic boss, being in several different games in different iterations. And I remember the first time I walked in the door, slammed it shut, and it was so dark and ominous in there, and you can hear the noise of her shuffling, and you look up, and you see the eye. She really only possesses a threat, maybe because you have three hearts, and or maybe if you've never played Ocarina of Time, or uh, maybe you're new to Zelda games at all. But it does do a good job of giving you time to use the slingshot. Unfortunately, Goma can be easily killed, uh, very quickly rather. So with all of that being said, I'm going to give the Great Deku Temple Dungeon a final grade of B-. The reason being, first time through, I thought it was pretty cool. But playing it now over and over again when you love the game so much, uh, let's say the dungeon's kind of mid. They're worse, but they're also way better. Other random thoughts that I had as I was writing up my notes, the dungeon does a good job as an introductory dungeon. It teaches Z-targeting, combat, puzzle solving, use of stunning, torching, and shield reflecting, but otherwise it's not really that exciting to replay after the first playthrough and can pretty much be seen as a kind of a lame roadblock to the rest of the good really solid chunk of the game. And also it feels kind of pointless in the end because, spoiler alert, after all these years, the Great Decker Tree still dies. Even though it also comes back later as a sprout, but there's definitely no erasing that memory of that feeling I had the first time I saved the Great Deku Temple, or at least thought I did, and he still dies. Yeah, that was like the definition of a bruh moment for me. Bruh. That's going to conclude this first video. Next time, I'll probably get into the next dungeon, the Dodongo Cavern. So please tune in, check that out, leave a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe, it really helps me. Right now, I'm currently on the journey to get a thousand subscribers by the end of the year. If I can get more, awesome. Thank you very much. I love making videos like this. It was a lot of fun, and I can't wait to see where it goes. Assuming this series go well, I'd love to cover the dungeons and some other games. With that being said, feel free to leave a comment with another game you might want me to break down more in depth. And as always, have a great day, like, subscribe, Bye bye